All right, good afternoon. Uh, I know you're here to hear about last night's officer-involved shooting, uh, but first I want to announce two recent closures that we've had. Uh, as you may recall, on Monday, May 28th, at approximately 2.15 p.m., members of the 7th District were called to the 2300 block of Skyland Place Southeast for a shooting involving an ice cream truck driver. Uh, during the course of the investigation, it was learned that two suspects approached the victim while he was in his ice cream truck and asked to purchase some items. Uh, while our victim went to retrieve the items, one of the suspects produced a firearm and announced a robbery. Uh, our suspects took money from the victim uh, and shot him in the leg before fleeing on foot. Members of the 7th District Detective's Office were able to get arrest warrants for two suspects. Last night, 22-year-old Shaquille Taylor of Northeast D.C. and 23-year-old Dion Cannon of Southwest D.C were arrested and they were charged with assault with a dangerous weapon, a gun, and robbery. I want to thank our 7th District Detective's Office for bringing that case to closure. I'd also like to announce the closure of a homicide case that occurred earlier this morning in the 5th District. At approximately 12.52 a.m., members of the 5th District were dispatched to the 1200 block of Mount Olivet Road Northeast in reference to a shooting. Uh, when the officers arrived, they located an, adu an adult male uh, who had sustained a fatal gunshot wound. Uh, DC Fire and EMS uh, arrived on the scene and they pronounced the victim dead. Our victim was identified as 43-year-old Larry Harrell of Northeast DC. During the course of the investigation, homicide detectives were able to quickly develop a suspect and gather enough evidence to charge him in this murder. Uh, arrested and charged was Titus Irax, a 16-year-old of Southeast D.C. He's been charged with first-degree murder while armed in the shooting death of Mr. Harrell. Uh, Mr. Irax is going to be charged as an adult. Uh, this case was brought to closure by Detective Ryan Devlin and other members of our homicide unit. Uh, and I know this closure will never bring uh, Larry back, but we want to extend our condolences to his family and friends for their loss. Uh, yesterday, a little after 7.10 p.m., uniformed members uh, of the Metropolitan Police Department in marked patrol vehicles were on patrol in the area of the 3700 block of 1st Street Southeast. A male who was later identified as 22-year-old Marquise Alston of Southeast Washington, D.C., fled from the officers on foot into an alley. Several MPD officers pursued him on foot when Mr. Alston produced an illegal semi-automatic handgun and fired it at the pursuing officers. Two officers returned fire and the suspect was killed. The suspect's death was immediately apparent on the scene. MPD recovered the suspect's firearm and also recovered shell casings that we believe were fired from that weapon. Also recovered from Mr. Alston's possession was an additional extended magazine with live rounds of ammunition. Thankfully, none of the police officers or the innocent bystanders who were in the area were injured. Mr. Alston was under CSOSA supervision and was wearing a GPS monitoring bracelet. Mr. Alston was also under, has been under supervision since this past March, uh, where uh, prior to that, uh, he had been charged and convicted with a robbery and a gun case. Uh, where he had su served two years. Uh, because of the recent violence in Ward 8, MPD has pledged to that community that we are going to precisely target illegal firearms and repeat violent offenders. Last night, MPD officers were working to remove illegal firearms from our community, and this incident is an example of exactly how extremely dangerous this can be. Uh, and again, I want to say that I am extremely grateful that no police officers or innocent bystanders were injured. Uh, Deputy Mayor Donahue is going to come up now and talk a little bit about the body-worn camera. Uh, thank you, Chief. Um, I want to start off by saying that any loss of life under any circumstances is tragic. Um, I also want to express, as the Chief did, my gratefulness for the officers 
um, uh, that uh, none of them were injured and no innocent bystanders were injured as well. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the process related to body-worn camera footage. Uh, in the event an MPD officer is involved in the shooting, um, body-worn camera footage um, from each officer gets, uh, reporting to the scene is reviewed and considered as evidence. Uh, legislation establishing the district's body-worn camera program allows for the public release of body-worn camera footage in cases where there is great public interest. Uh, and under the law, there is consultation from the mayor to the D.C. Attorney General and the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia. At this time, the mayor's office has initiated this process of review and consultation related to the body-worn camera footage. We will continue to consult with the U.S. Attorney's Office and the D.C. Attorney General's Office in making the determination of when the body-worn camera footage, uh, when and if the body-worn camera footage can be publicly released without jeopardizing an ongoing investigation. The shooting itself is subject to an independent review and investigation by the U.S. Attorney's Office. In the coming days, the mayor will complete this review and make a decision about the video release. All right, we can take any questions that you have. Chief? Last night at the scene, it was, it, was, it was not clear whether the suspect had fired directly at the officers. Have you guys made a determination of whether he was shooting at the officers or at somebody else? From the evidence that we've gathered and information from independent witnesses, witnesses we have determined that uh, he was shooting at the police officers, uniformed police officers. Uh, who arrived in marked police cars. How many uh, casings were found? We're not going to talk details about the number of casings. Did you find any of the, the bullets uh, where they struck you so they didn't hit any officers? But did you find we did not. I don't believe we found any bullet strikes, correct? Well, we did not. Chief, uh, yesterday at the scene there were some, a lot of people saying that they heard a steady stream of gunfire, as, we, as I mentioned to you yesterday, and that they didn't hear a crossfire. <coughs> Obviously, the facts are coming out that there was exchange of gunfire. This suspect fired. Um, a lot of people saying that they don't trust the police. Another incident of, you know, a guy got down. What's your response to those individuals who obviously you have the facts, but this was their interpretation of it? What's yeah, I think there, is a, there are some, unfortunately, uh, that use Facebook as a medium for, for spreading misinformation in our community. And some people, when they see that misinformation, uh, they latch onto it. Uh, I saw one of the folks that you interviewed, uh, and he heard a steady stream of gunfire. I saw that interview. Uh, I think it's extreme. I've listened to a lot of gunfire over the last 29 years. Uh, as you know, we have shot spotter here in the District of Columbia. Uh, it's very difficult to determine uh, an exchange of gunfire just from listening to gunshots. Uh, so that could have been his interpretation. I can tell you that we have a, a pretty significant amount of evidence uh, to suggest uh, that the decedent in this case was armed, uh, he was a felon, uh, he was under supervision, uh, and he fired at our police officers. And to save their lives, uh, the police officers returned fire. I'm just, I'm just speaking about the, the, the feeling of, of distrust. So obviously, those are the facts, but these individuals had the, you know, had in their mind that this is what they heard. Yeah, there, there, there is a, yeah, that's a good, good point. There is a small group uh, within our community <clears throat> who is very uh, uh, <clears throat> uncomfortable with, with the police. And, and like I said, frequently uh, they will get onto Facebook and other sources of social media and, and put out misinformation. And it's very uh, difficult for the police department <laughs> sometimes to overcome that because we can only give the information that we have to. We have to be as factual and accurate as we possibly can. Uh, and with regards to trust, I can tell you the overwhelming majority of the people uh, in this city and in Ward 8 in particular are very trustful of the police. Uh, there is, of course, some folks who don't trust the police. And what that means is that we just have more work to do to try and gain that trust. Uh, and the way that we gain that trust is, I believe, is to be as accurate uh, and as truthful as we possibly can when we do have information and to share it as quickly as we can. And that's what we're trying to do here in this case. How many of the officers fired their weapons and you know how many shots? And, and what is the status of the three officers? Yeah, we have two officers that fired their weapons, and we're not going to talk about numbers. Chief, uh, have, you, have you viewed the body cam video? Have I viewed the body one camera video? Yes, I have. And your reaction to it? Uh, it's a piece of the evidence that we have. Uh, and like I said, we have an overwhelming amount of evidence uh, that the suspect in this case fired his weapon at our police officers. Chief, what led to the encounter uh, in the first place? Uh, originally, we were told a group of men and the alley, but it seems like the alley was later. 
Yeah, well, you know, it was it, it happened very quickly. Police, uniformed police officers in, in patrol cars came into the area. <clears throat> the suspect fled. Uh, one of the officers saw him reaching into his waistband, which was indicative of he was potentially armed. Uh, and then very quickly thereafter, we had a, a, the suspect that opened fire on our police officers. Like just based on the sight of the officers? Could very well be. Is that what instigated the pursuit, or was it the, the reaching into the waistband that prompted it, it? I think that the, the initial pursuit was the fact that the, this uh, uh, suspect fled from the officers when they arrived on this. And were the specific officers uh, working on this program to target illegal firearms and repeat offenders, or were they just on a general? Patrol? All of our police officers in the District of Columbia are, target, are tasked with uh, getting illegal firearms out of our community. It's been a push uh, by me. Uh, I think rightfully so. I truly believe that illegal firearms are contributing significantly uh, to the level of violence that we have in our city. Uh, you know, we can see we had a homicide last just last night or early this morning uh, by way of a firearm, uh, and we have a responsibility to take these weapons off the street. And so every every member of the Metropolitan Police Department uh, is going to do everything we possibly can to, to to remove these illegal firearms from our community. And Chief, was this guy with a group of people? Because um, I know last night it was that there was there was a group of people and they were being chased by police and then they dispersed. So we're not looking for anyone else. Huh? There, we we are not looking for anyone else in this case. And that that's the scary thing about this particular incident is you know you had a, a person out there who felt it was okay uh, to carry an illegal firearm in our community, as you as you can see for yourself because you were out there last night as well. Uh, many people were just out there enjoying a, a peaceful evening, and it was disrupted uh, by this illegal event. So thank you all very much. Uh, I just have a question. Does, um, does he have a, you said he was a felon under police supervision. What's his criminal history? I can't talk in detail about his criminal history, but you may want to talk to the court services and offender supervision agency about that. Thank you all. Thank you.